Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining our first legal update webinar of 2024. My name is Valentin, and I am an internal consultant here at the Compliance People. About me, I have a year and a half experience working uh, with the Legislation Update Service, OLAS, and I specialize in writing and updating content that covers environmental and health and safety legislation from the UK and the EU. Presenting with me today are my colleagues Matt and Tom, who will introduce themselves during their part of the presentation. Moving to today's agenda, we will cover key changes in the health and safety as well as the environmental legislation over the past six months. First, Matt will give a brief overview of how the status of EU law retained by the UK changed to a simulated law at the end of 2023. We will then look at key changes in the environment legislation, such as updates to the carbon border adjustment mechanisms, requirements for biodiversity gain, and also key changes to energy and climate change legislation, as well as latest changes in the waste legislation. In the health and safety, section of our presentation, we will cover recent changes to building safety, driver safety, and hazardous substances legislation. Next, in the final part of the presentation, we, of the webinar, we will hold the 15 minutes Q&A session. If you'd like to ask a question during, uh, during the webinar, please use the Q&A function in Zoom to do so. We will try and answer as many questions as possible before, before, uh, before the end of the webinar. But if the time won't allow us to answer it all, the remaining questions will be reviewed offline and the copy of answers sent, sent out to all attendees. If you're already a last subscriber and you have a specific question, more specific to your organization, then please get in touch using the helpline function on LAS. I will now pass on to Matt for an overview to the assimilated law. Thanks very much, Valentin, and um, good morning all. Um, so, yeah, my name's Matt, as Valentin said. Um, I'm an EHS consultant here with the compliance people I joined last year. Um, I specialise in also writing legal content, both from an environmental and a health and safety perspective. But my background um, is actually in occupational health and safety. So you'll see me again later in the session um, covering health and safety. Um, but before we do any of that, I wanted just to, to provide a quick recap on assimilated law and its status. The reason being is that in this webinar, we will refer to um, some EU originating laws that still apply in the EU, some that still apply in Northern Ireland, and some that don't apply in the EU version uh, anymore in Great Britain. So just to, to kind of explain it, at the end of 2023, EU legislation retained by the UK became assimilated law. Essentially, we took that legislation as it stood from a couple of years ago, and we put it into our own set of law. What this does is it essentially gives that legislation the same status as secondary legislation in the UK, so the same status as regulations and orders. It also removed the concept of EU set supremacy, so that means that we in the UK are not bound by European Union decisions. And it also gave um, our, our ministers and governments all across the UK additional powers to modify um, that assimilated law. So essentially what that means um, is that it becomes our own UK British law now. It's no longer in, under the control of the European Union. It is worth noting though some EU laws still do apply in the EU version under the Windsor framework in Northern Ireland. Um, and predominantly, these are EU laws that are related to the movement of, of goods between jurisdictions. So just as a very quick example, um, you might be familiar with REACH, which is 
a regulation concerning registration, evaluation, authorization, and restriction of chemicals. Um, effectively, now post Brexit, there are two versions of of reach. There is EU reach that applies in the European Union and Northern Ireland still. And then there is UK reach, which confusingly actually doesn't apply to the whole of the UK, but only applies to Great Britain. Um, basically, these two versions are, are at the moment pretty much identical, but over time there is the potential that they will diverge as the UK makes changes for UK reach and the EU makes different changes to, to EU reach. Um, so just to be aware that in circumstances like this, there are two different versions of the legislation, one that applies to certain jurisdictions, one that applies to other jurisdictions. And um, as it shows on this slide, um, the, the EU version, um, you can get it from Europe.eu and the UK version, um, it can be found on legislation.gov.uk. That's it on, in terms of assimilated law. If you do have any questions on it, please feel free to chat uh, and use the Q&A function. But I'll now hand over to Tom, who's going to give you an update on what's been happening with environment legislation over the last few months. Right, thanks for that, Matt. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> My name's Tom. Uh, I work as an internal consultant here at the Compliance People. Um, I've worked on the legislation update service um, for about four and a half years now, um, specialising in the writing and updating of legal content, uh, covering both the environmental and occupational health and safety side of things uh, across the UK and the EU. Um, we're now going to go over the uh, environmental part of this webinar. <clears throat> so... Firstly, we're going to be taking a look at the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, also known as CBAM. So CBAM will put a price on the uh, carbon emissions of goods imported into the EU. Uh, the purpose of this is to stop organisations avoiding EU tax on carbon emissions um, via the um, EU ETS um, by importing uh, by importing goods from countries where either the tax for carbon emissions are lower or there is no tax at all. So the EU is currently in a transitional phase of uh, introducing uh, CBAM. Um, so it only currently requires importers to report the imports of uh, certain goods uh, with the definitive regime and the payments associated with that regime applying from 2026. So currently, um, the goods that must be reported on are spread across the six categories that are on your screen now. So these are cement, iron and steel, aluminium, fertilisers, electricity and hydrogen and the requirement to report is determined by the CN code for a, a given product. Uh, in general the reporting is required uh, for raw materials and products of a single type of these goods uh, so reporting is uh, again not generally required for complete products of multiple types of goods such as vehicles so for example a car will contain um, both steel and aluminium um, so that doesn't fall within the scope as of today. Uh, and then while CBAM is currently exclusive to the European Union, uh, the UK uh, is planning to introduce its own CBAM system uh, from 2027. However, details on this uh, have not really been released yet. Uh, so uh, it's something to keep an eye out for if you are based in the UK. Next, we're going to be taking a look at the new approach that's been taken for developments around biodiversity gain in England. So certain developments, uh, and this will include small developments from the 2nd of April this year, are required to deliver a 10% diversity net gain. So this uh, this means that developments must result in, a, in more or a better quality of natural habitat than was there before a given development began. Uh, this is all based around the idea of uh, biodiversity net gain. So biodiversity net gain is measured using what are called uh, biodiversity units. So the biodiversity units... Uh, consider take into consideration the the size the quality the location and the type of habitats uh, involved uh, so what else has been uh, introduced around biodiversity gain we have biodiversity gain plans now being required for most developments we have uh, developers may apply for planning permission without conditions where previous permissions have already been granted and a biodiversity gain plan is already in place 
We also have exemptions in place around biodiversity game plans. Uh, so such as for uh, small self-built projects and emergency crown developments. There is full guidance uh, around exemptions found on the gov.uk website. So if you feel this is something that might apply to you, it is well worth going to check the full details around these exemptions. And we also have regulations um, that have been put in place that require Natural England to establish and maintain a public register for biodiversity gain sites. We're now going to go on and look at the uh, Energy Savings Opportunity Scheme, uh, also known as ESOS. Uh, so what is ESOS? Uh, under ESOS, large organisations and groups must undertake energy assessments and produce reports. Whether or not this is relevant to you or your organisation will depend on whether you meet the criteria of a large organisation and group. So um, the first set of criteria is if you have more uh, 250 or more employees, you will be classed as a large organisation or group under ESOS. However, if you do not meet this criteria, but you do have an annual turnover in excess of £44 million and an annual balance sheet in excess of £38 million, you will be considered a large undertaking and have responsibilities under ESOS. So let's have a look at what's changed with ESOS. So only 5% of energy consumption can now be excluded from an audit. This is a reduction from the previous rate of 10% that could have been excluded. Details of costs, uh, benefits, and an implementation program is required in an audit. Certain information must now be disclosed publicly or to the scheme administrator. And organisations with lower annual energy usage do not need to appoint a lead assessor. Uh, if you're an organisation that consumes less than 40,000 kilowatt hours of um, energy annually, then instead of a lead assessor, you can appoint two reasonable office, officers uh, in place of the lead assessor. And now we'll look at climate change agreements. Uh, so what exactly are climate change agreements? So climate change agreements, these are voluntary agreements between industry organisations and the UK government uh, intended to uh, reduce energy use and emissions in exchange for a reduced climate change levy rate. So the, the climate change levy is a tax on energy uh, usage, essentially, that is paid by organisations to the government. Uh, this levy is automatically added onto an organization's energy bills. So even if you are unaware that this is um, something that you might be paying, then you could well still be paying it. As, a, as I say, it is automatically added to your energy bills. So the scheme itself has been updated uh, in, the, in the following ways. So the UK's climate change agreement scheme has been extended um, from the 1st of March 2025 to the 31st of March 2027. As a result of this extension, uh, a new target period, which is known as target period six, this is introduced from the 1st of uh, January 2024 until the 31st of December 2024. So during this target period, uh, those with uh, during the target period, those with climate change agreements must measure and report their energy use um, and carbon emissions against agreed upon targets. So we also have increased fees and penalties applying uh, from target period six. These increased fees and penalties include um, the buyout fee increasing from £18 per tonne of CO2 equivalent to £25 per tonne, and the maximum financial penalty being doubled to £500. The EU has also updated its regulations concerning uh, fluorinated greenhouse gases and ozone depleting substances. Um, as you've probably noticed by the flags next to the uh, title of this, uh, this page, these new regulations will apply in both the EU the Republic of Ireland, but also in Northern Ireland as well. So for F gases, the rules on hydrofluorocarbons, also known as HFCs, these have been tightened uh, with the EU plan to completely phase out their use by 2050. Additional restrictions also now apply to the use of F gases. Uh, the use of F gases in certain equipment has been banned with the phase out of F gases in um, other equipment, um, certain air conditioning units, heat pumps, uh, switch gears, starting from 2030. We also have some changes to uh, for ozone depleting substances. So we have uh, increased reporting of the use of ozone depleting substances is now required. Uh, Organisations must report their use of these types of substances by the 31st of March 2025. And then from that point, they must also report it annually. Organisations must also avoid emissions from works involving foam panels. Uh, this takes effect uh, from the 1st of January 2025 for organisations that either uh, renovate, uh, refurbish or demolish buildings and structures. 
Uh, yeah, if you do uh, operate in the EU or in Northern Ireland um, and use ozone depleting substances or ref gases, uh, we would recommend you check out the new entries on the legislation update service. We'll also be publishing um, articles to provide additional guidance and information in the near future around these topics. And it's also worth noting that the uh, the older the assimilated versions of the 2014 fluorinated greenhouse gases regulations and the 2009 um, substances that deplete ozone layer regulations these ones continue to apply in Great Britain. So that is in England, Wales, and Scotland, just not in Northern Ireland or the European Union. We're now going to have a quick look at uh, legal changes around single-use plastics. Uh, so in 2018, uh, regu we had regulations coming into effect that ban the manufacture and sale of certain products containing uh, plastic microbeads. And then again in 2020, we saw additional legislation restricting the supply of uh, single-use plastic straws, stirrers and cotton buds. We now have uh, more regulations that further expand the scope of um, bans on single-use plastics. So we have the uh, sale and supply of the following single-use plastic products banned from the 1st of October last year. So these are in effect as of today. We have uh, single-use plastic cutlery, uh, polystyrene food and drinks containers, polystyrene cups, balloon sticks, plates, bowls, and trays. And as you can see, we do have exemptions around the uh, single-use plastic plates, bowls, and trays. So these items can continue to be sold to other businesses as long as that business itself is not an end user. Uh, and there's also an exemption for these uh, products where they are packaging that is either pre-filled or filled at the point of sale, such as a, um, a bowl that is pre-filled with food or a plastic tray that is used to serve food, for example. Definitions have also been updated for uh, both household packaging and exempt packaging under the Packaging Waste Data Reporting Scotland regulations. So uh, these regulations are all around the collection of data on packaging in Scotland in preparation for the new um, extended producer responsibility fee that certain packaging producers will start paying from uh, 2025 as it stands. So if you are a uh, packaging producer in Scotland, this will likely be of interest to you. So the definition of household packaging now excludes packaging supplied to or for use by an organisation or public institution. It also excludes packaging unlikely to be uh, disposed of in a household or public bin, and it excludes packaging imported into the UK. The definition of exempt packaging now excludes packaging which falls under the Scotland uh, Deposit and Return Scheme, such as single-use cans and drinks containers. We also have a change um, to the uh, who is classified as a producer or supplier. So um, under the regulations, which will affect the scope of regulations and who it will affect. Uh, so the organi uh, organizations who use or import packaging, which does not belong to another UK owner, is now classified as a producer or supplier of that packaging. Uh, so this includes packs and fillers, uh, importers and first UK owners. And the decision has been made to delay the implementation of the deposit and return scheme in Scotland. Um, so this is something to keep an eye on. Uh, it has been postponed until at least October 2025. That is the given date at the moment. This is to align with the implementation of uh, similar schemes in the rest of the UK. Uh, depending how those implementations progress, um, we could see further delays. Um, but we will uh, keep you up to date with that as information becomes available. Now we're going to look at developments in workplace recycling in Wales. So we have a Wales that has introduced new regulations requiring that workplaces separate waste in a similar way to the way households have to. And these have been introduced by the Waste Separation Requirements Wales Regulations 2023. So from the 6th of April 2024, uh, the following wastes need to be separated from other wastes. We have waste foods, we have uh, waste paper and card, waste glass, waste metal and plastics, small uh, waste electrical and electronic items, and unsold textiles. The Welsh Government, um, they have produced a code of practice available online that provides guidance on how to comply with these new requirements. If you do have a premises in Wales and are have not been aware of these changes or are not fully prepared for these changes, we would recommend contacting your waste carrier 
uh, they will be able to support you through the transition um, and they, they will know uh, the best way to deal with it. So in the last webinar that we did, we did discuss the plan changes for waste exemptions in England, which we will recap on the next slide. It is, uh, it is expected that the current waste carrier broker dealer system in England will also be overhauled this year. So this includes changes to waste exemptions, but also to uh, the replacement of certain roles. So three new roles will be created. We will have transporters, who are those who move waste. We will have controllers, who are those who organise waste collection and movement. And we have controller transporters. These are those who uh, organise and move waste. And other changes include cash-only transactions will be banned. And registrations uh, will require an environmental permit or a registered exemption. It is also worth noting that uh, permits will differentiate uh, the scale and the type of waste that is going to be carried. And uh, as a reminder uh, of the changes to waste exemptions, uh, the following exemptions are set to be changed or removed this year. I will also mention that we do have a video on our website that goes into more detail about the changes to waste exemptions. So if you feel this is something that is going to impact you, I would suggest going to watch that video as it is uh, got a lot more detail around this area. Uh, if you utilize any of these exemptions, it's important to consider that permits might be required in the future. Uh, DEFRA still haven't set out a definitive timescale for the implementation of these changes, but they are expected to start this year and uh, continue into 2025. Okay, I'll pass you back over to Matt now um, for the health and safety side of things of the webinar. Yeah, thanks a lot, Tom. Um, really good update on um, changes in the environment there. So, yes, uh, I'll cover um, the, the key changes to health and safety over the last six months and, and going into the next month because there's a few pieces of... Uh, legislation that comes in force um at the start of april um i'll try and keep it high level as you could probably imagine if you certainly if you're based in england and wales uh the key legislation has been dominated um by building safety over the last six months as it has been uh for for the past few years following uh the building safety act 2022 so we'll get straight into it we'll have a look at building safety first um in england so a key thing to know is that from next month on the 6th of April, the Building Approved Inspectors uh, Regulations 2010 no longer apply in England. They will still apply in Wales with amendment or we'll cover Wales um, in a few moments' time, but effectively the whole regime for the inspection and approval of buildings uh, it will now um, have been implemented um, in England. So... These regulations from 2010, they're effectively uh, repealed and replaced by two regulations. Uh, the first set of regulations came in on the 1st of October 2023, which is the Higher Risk Buildings Procedures Regulations for England. And this requires that all building work involving higher risk buildings in England must now be approved by the building safety regulator. I'm imagining a lot um, of you are already fully aware of this, but just to confirm, in England, a higher risk building is any building that is 18 metres or higher or contains seven or more storeys and has two or more residential units within it. So basically, if you're doing any type of work, construction work on those types of buildings that includes erections, extensions, um, change of use or significant structural alterations, then all of that type of work it now has to be approved by the building safety regulator. It cannot be approved by anybody else. And the building safety regulator is part of the health and safety executive. So that was a big change. But then there is a more recent change, and this takes effect from the 6th of April. And this effectively covers building work that falls under the regulatory reform fire safety order, but not for higher risk buildings. So here we've got the registered building control approvers regulations for England. And basically what this means is that if you're having building work done that doesn't fall under a higher risk building, 
but does fall under the regulatory reform fire safety order. And that applies to all workplaces as well as any shared residential accommodation where there are common parts of the building, then that falls under the RRFSM. And that even must be approved that work by a registered building control approver or the local authority. So effectively in England now, we've got building control either through the building safety regulator for higher risk buildings or for others that aren't higher risk buildings, but the RRFSO applies, that must be approved by a building control approver or a local authority. So those are kind of big changes um, coming up, but there have been a lot of other wider regulations that come in that support these and work together with these. So just have a quick look at those. So there was another set of regulations that were came into force on the 1st of October. This was the approved inspectors and review of decisions in with regulations. And this basically requires that both building inspectors and building control approvers must be registered with the building safety regulator. And um, so essentially to be authorized to undertake the work, the activities or functions in those roles, you have to be authorized to do so by the building safety regulator um, for for England. Similar um, arrangements apply for what else we'll discuss at the moment. 16th of January, a couple of pieces of um, law came into effect um, in England as well. Both of these apply to the accountable person for higher risk buildings. So the first one is the higher risk buildings management of safety risks England regulations. And this requires a couple of things. One is that it requires that the accountable person for a higher risk building must manage the safety risks for that building. And the second part of that is that they must display safety certificates for the building with their details on the certificates. So this is part of ensuring that ownership is taken for higher risk buildings, that safety is being managed proactively and effectively. Um, there is a, a huge range of things that an accountable person for a higher risk building must do to ensure that they fulfill these duties. And just in, in case you're not aware, essentially the accountable person for a higher risk building or a principal accountable person, if there's more than one, is the person who has ultimate control over that building. Um, so it might be the owner or the controller of the shared um, areas of the building. Um, so the safety risks that they need to manage, things like preventive fire spread and collapse of the, the building due to fire or other structural issues. Um, accountable person needs to now prepare and regularly review a safety case report for, for the building that they're um, responsible for. They have to introduce mandatory occurrence reporting systems and complaints procedures. So if residents or occupants or owners of units within a building find faults, there needs to be a procedure in place that they can report that. And so the, 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 the accountable person needs to take appropriate action. And they also need to ensure that key information is made available to all occupants and users of a building and the authorities as well. So quite a lot in there, and that's supplemented by these next set of regulations, which is the keeping and provision of information, England regulations. So this essentially makes it a legal duty for the accountable person for these higher risk buildings to ensure that they've established and make available the golden thread of information. Um, if you're not aware of what the golden thread of information was, this term was... Um, and kind of enshrined and, and proposed as part of that overall change to building safety as part of Dame Judith Hackett's um, initial report post Grenfell. And the golden thread of information is all of the key information required for a building to effectively manage the safety and risk posed by its use, its occupation, changes to it, etc. Uh, information that's needed in, in terms of the golden thread, it's lengthy. So what I would advise is if you are an accountable person or you want to know all of the information that is defined as information under the golden thread, go and have a look at the regulations. It's all in Schedule 1. 
But to give you an idea, it's things like plans for the building and its services, certificates, so building safety certificates, occupational certificates, um, structural plans, um, risk assessments, including fire risk assessments, um, records of all complaints, contravention notices, things like that. Um, so it's a lot of information. So the accountable person for building now has that responsibility to ensure that all of that information is available and stored. And then lastly, for England, there's another set of regulations that come in on the 6th of April um, as well. And this is the Building Restricted Activities and Functions England regulations. And effectively, this goes in hand, hand in hand with what I talked about on the last slide about the approved inspectors regulations um, being replaced and repealed in, in England. Um, and this basically, these regulations mean that certain activities can only be undertaken by building control authorities in England, which are your local authorities, the building safety regulator and registered building control approvers. And or activities that are restricted to those organisations, they need to seek advice from registered building inspectors in order to, to make approvals uh, and sign off certificates ex etc undertake inspections so lots of changes in England regarding building safety that all collectively come together um, and if you've been following this over the last few years as I have um, you know we're, we're now in kind of the final straight of the overhaul of building safety and control for England the same as in Wales so let's have a look at Wales now so in Wales, um, regulations are coming in slightly behind England. A lot of the changes are, are very similar, but there are quite a few key differences as well. So if you operate in Wales or you're responsible for building to Wales or working construction in Wales, really key that you, you ensure that you know what, what are the, the subtle differences between the two countries. So in Wales, from the 1st of January, essentially, three new regulations came into force. The first one, um, the description of higher-risk buildings, effectively defined what a higher-risk building is in Wales. Uh, very similar to England in the fact that a higher-risk building is one that is 18 metres or more in height or seven or more storeys. However, in Wales, it only needs to contain one residential unit to be classed as a higher-risk building. That's different for England, where there's it needs two or more residential units. So that's that's something just to, to be aware of, that the, the, the definition is slightly stricter in Wales. Another set of legislation that was brought in covers the building control profession. Effectively, this looks at the registration of your building inspectors and building control approvers. This is identical to England, that inspectors can be approved for a period of four years and registered building control approvers can be registered and approved for a period of five years. Um, like in England, um, it will be the building safety regulator who will um, essentially administrate this system and do all the registrations and approvals. Um, so although the building safety regulator doesn't actually kind of all building work in Wales as part of the new regime, they will be supported with this in terms of approval and, and registration of inspectors and building control approvers. And then the final one that, that took effect at the start of this year is the, the building control profession charges. Um, and effectively, this means that cost for regulating building control might be recouped through charges. So a prime example of this is if you're an organisation who wants to be registered by the, the building safety regulator as a registered building control approver, there is a fee to pay for that. And that fee goes towards the overall administration of um, regulating building control across the countries. So those are, are the key changes that came in at the start of this year. And there are a few key changes that also come in on the 6th of April. So the first one is the commencement number four to the Building Safety Act. Um, no huge changes um, here that, that kind of you're probably not aware of. But basically, 
transitional arrangements have been put in place so that if you are a building inspector at the moment and you're overseeing work that is ongoing with a higher risk building, as long as you register now as a registered building control approver, you may continue to oversee that existing work with that high risk building. Otherwise, if you're not kind of upgraded to becoming registered building control approver, you're going to have to, to hand it over. Um, from the 6th of April, all new work involving high risk buildings must be overseen by local authorities um, in Wales. So this is quite different to England, where we have the separate building safety regulator who will control high risk building work. Wales, it's local authorities that will actually do that. There's also restricted activities of functions regulations in Wales. Again, part of this is to basically restrict who is allowed to perform certain activities and functions, such as issuing certificates, issuing approvals, conducting inspections to, to validate that um, a building is compliant. Um, basically, it's your, your building control authority. So in Wales, your local authorities and your, your registered building control approvers that are the only two bodies allowed to do that. And the final one, so I, I mentioned um, a few slides ago that in England, the approved inspectors um, regulations from 2010 are now, now repealed and replaced, but in Wales, they're not. They will continue but with modification. And this regulation, the approved inspectors of Benham Wales regulations 2024, essentially updates them. And it basically updates the forms and procedures um, for this new building control regime in Wales. So that's kind of the final one at the moment that has been passed and coming into force in Wales. So quite a few different changes there, both for England and Wales, that all come collectively to, to update building control. Um, the vast majority of changes to building control in terms of the legislative requirements are now in place. We do expect that there will be changes throughout 2024 and beyond as things are tightened up and things need to, to be clarified or amended and tweaked slightly. And so if you are um if you are a subscriber to Lux, we'll obviously keep you updated on there and we'll we'll issue articles as we have been doing because we understand it's quite complex when so many pieces of legislation are coming through over an extended period of time and all work collectively. So um, other changes from a health and safety perspective, there's been a few changes regarding driving safety over the last few months. Um, so the first change um, is in respect to tachographs, um, and this covers both the UK, Ireland and, and European Union. There's a couple of different um, pieces of legislation um, around this. One is the regulation covering tachographs in road transport, there's also the UK's own you know, driver's hours and tachographs amendment regulations. The key thing to know is that um, requirements for tachographs in vehicles is changing um, and vehicles will, moving forward, need smart tachograph too um, because that's becoming the mandatory standard. Uh, if you're not sure what I'm aware of, but this is relevant to you, basically Smart Tachograph 2 is the second generation of smart digital tachographs. It has features such as advanced security. It also has GPS location and monitors border crossings. Um, so it's a lot more robust as a system. Um, as it stands right now, any vehicle that is being manufactured from this point onwards has to have a Smart Tachograph 2 installed in it by default. If you have got vehicles that require a tachograph and they don't have a smart tachograph whatsoever, a first generation or the second generation, then they're going to need to be updated by the end of this year and have a smart tachograph too installed. If you've got the first generation of smart tachograph installed in vehicles, then those need update into the second generation, but only by the 19th of August next year in the UK. And in the middle of 2026, there is another change to tachographs. And that's from the 1st of July in the UK, vehicles over two and a half tons will also need smart tachographs as well. 
So which in this case will be the, the second generation unless they, they bring another generation in before that point. Uh so yeah, if you're um if you're operating vehicles with tachographs, um I would recommend go and have a look at the legislation, look at how it impacts you, look at time scales if you need to potentially swap your vehicles over. Um, another change is goods vehicle licenses in Great Britain. And basically, there's been an update to the goods vehicles licensing of operators regulations in 1995. This essentially allows vehicles to temporarily enter Great Britain without holding a UK operator's license. And vehicles can do that, providing an agreement exists between the UK and the originating country of that vehicle. The whole purpose of this is just to prevent any issues with vehicles moving between jurisdictions, particularly from kind of Europe into Great Britain, where they'll be delivering and transporting goods, you know, and they might enter GB for a very short period of time, returning back to, to Europe or Republic of Ireland, etc. So that's the purpose of those. And the final one is a law that just affects the Republic of Ireland and quite nice it's spray suppression on hgvs um so the road traffic spray suppression systems regulations 2023 basically requires that all vehicles and trailers manufactured in the republic of ireland um after 2011 have to be fitted with spray suppression at each axle so effectively they have to have uh mud guards um bay guards on, on each so that's driving safety. And we've also got some changes for hazardous substances as well. The first one is about restricted substances, and this covers the EU and Northern Ireland. Um, this goes back to um, REACH that I mentioned in assimilated law right at the start of today's webinar. Effectively, microplastics have now been added to the list of restricted substances under EU reach. So that means that microplastics may only be permitted to be used for certain um, for certain uses. A change in Great Britain is an update to the classification, labelling and packaging regulations. And this all relates to something called um, a UFI or unique formula identifier, which is a requirement in the EU. Uh, so if you produce substances, so chemical substances or mixtures, uh, and package them, and in the EU, basically on your label, you have to have a 16-digit alphanumeric code, which is your unique formula identifier. And that identifies the substance actually in the product as well as the manufacturer. Uh, because the UK or Great Britain in this instance is not part of the EU anymore, there is no longer a requirement to have that on, on labels. Um, whether we see any changes with that, I would imagine that a lot of organisations may retain keeping that on the label because then it allows easy transportation um, to Northern Ireland and the EU. Um, but technically, there's no longer a legal requirement for that now within Great Britain. There are also going to be changes regarding asbestos um, in Europe. And this comes as part of um, a new EU directive that amends the previous directive that protects workers from risks related to exposures to asbestos at work in the EU. Because it's an EU directive, it only applies to nation states themselves. So, you know, if you are based in an EU nation state, watch out for local legislation um, coming out that supports this. You know, um, for Northern Ireland, will uh, sorry, for the Republic of Ireland, will obviously add this on as soon as, um, uh, as the government makes their local legislation there. But essentially two things are, are changing. So one is that all organisations must develop a exposure register for workers who are exposed to asbestos, even if the risk is low. So beforehand, um, organisations didn't need to register 
or potential interactions with asbestos if the risk was low. And now they will need to, to document all of that and keep records of it. And the second change will be that in five years' time, from 2029, um, the workplace exposure limits will actually be reduced across the whole of the European Union. So as I say, at the moment, it's just a, a, a directive. Um, so there, there aren't any specific changes um, to organisations or individuals, but it's certainly one to keep an eye on, particularly if you, you work with an organisation where um, there is potential exposure to asbestos. And that is um, the conclusion of, of the health and safety um, update as part of the webinar. So I'll now pass back to, to balance it. Thank you for that, Matt. We are now at the end of our presentation. So next we will stop the screen sharing and uh, take a look at some of the questions you've asked during the webinar. All right, now, uh, first question is from David. David is asking, will the UK version of CBAN match the EU version? Would you like to take this one, Tom? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so it's it's hard to say at this point because we don't have much information on the UK version of CBAN. Um, we certainly expect it to at least somewhat, if not very closely, align with the EU's version. Um, I mean, it, it would make sense from the in allowing um, the movement of of goods between the two markets, um, especially with, uh, with Northern Ireland being part of the, the the UK, but also being closely tied, you know, to the EU through its land border with with the Republic of Ireland. So until we get more information, we can't be certain, but we we, we do expect there to be to be um, alignment between the two the two schemes. Okay, thank you, thank you for thank you for that. The next one uh, is from uh, Sahil. I hope I pronounce it correctly. If not, my apologies. Does CBAM include temporary imports? I think the question is if CBAM will also apply yeah, to temporary imports. Uh, by temporary imports, I assume it's uh, it's imports that you're importing to the market and then uh, will then be exported from the market. Uh, that will be something I will have to look up. I'm not entirely sure on that one. Um, I, I will we will put that in the in the email. I think to uh, go back to. I will have to double check. I don't want to give the the wrong answer on that one. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, the next one again from uh, from Sahil. Does the biodiversity <coughs> uh, gain apply to buildings already built? So the biodiversity net gain will um, apply to both um, if you are applying for uh, a, a, a planning position for development. So, for example, um, if you are doing some works on a building that is already built, then that development will uh, come under the um, biodiversity net gain requirements. And again, if you are building a new building, um, a new a new development, if you're working on a new development, that will also come under those requirements. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Tom. Next, uh, we'll take another one from David, who's asking how can companies, his company in particular, can check if they need to comply with the ESOS requirements. Uh, would you like to answer this one, Matt? Uh, yeah, um, of course. Um, so in, in terms of ESOS requirements, the, the, the best way of doing it is essentially looking at um, the size of the organisation um, against financial records and determining whether it is classed as a large organisation. Um, it's something that we can help with um, because it looks simple on paper because it looks at size of employees um, and then the total amount of revenue and um, capital um, that an organisation has. But essentially, um, yeah, if anyone wants some help, we can provide guidance on that and in terms of how to determine whether ESOS does apply to them or not. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that one. Uh, but uh, next, we have one from uh, Angela, who's asking how often should aspects and uh, the aspects and impacts register be reviewed? 
would you like to uh, give this one, Tom? Yeah, yeah, I can I can give some information on that one. Um, so, uh, for example, the ISO standards um, don't tell us exactly how often that they need to be reviewed, but uh, it is recommended that you um, perform an annual review of um, your aspects. Um, and also, uh, the aspects register should also be reviewed if there is uh, any change to the organization. So if you do your annual um, review, but then there is a change, say, halfway through the year, a review should also be conducted at that point. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Another another question from uh, Yolanda this time. This one is on F gases again for for you, Tom. Do imported vehicles chassis? I think is referring to the air conditioning, the cab air conditioning, come under the F gas legislation. So the um, the new uh, F gas regulations within the EU and. Um... The, the the new restrictions, I believe, on the F gases in here are, are within the legislation itself, um, within the annexes. Um, the thing Matt might be able to get, might be able to give more information on this because he, I think, you wrote these ones, Matt. But as I understand it from when I read them, the the new restrictions are very different for each type of of uh, product, each type of air conditioning unit, or whatever it might be. I'm not entirely sure on each product. Um, Exactly. I would recommend checking the, the entry on the Legislation Update Service if you are a subscriber, because it'll have a lot more information on there and the links where you can go to the annexes in the legislation and check individual products. Um, but yeah, that would be my suggestion on that one if it's about a specific uh, a specific product. Uh, I don't know if you've got anything else to add there, Matt, but... Um... Yes. Um, yeah, I, I certainly can because, yeah, um, I've been writing that, that the entry for the updated version. And... Union. So, yeah, you're absolutely right, Tom. Um, basically, it, it depends on a few things, what restrictions come in place in terms of F gases. Um, one is the type of F gas that is contained within equipment. So, depending on, on, on the type and um, how impactful it is in terms of its global warming potential, you know, there, there are certain types of restrictions on certain F gases rather than others. The other thing um, is that it depends on the use of the F gas and the quantities that are used as well. Certain restrictions come in sooner for certain F gases and their uses, whereas some are, are extended. So there's quite a few periods of change and, and restrictions that come in over the next five to six years and beyond um, as part of the regulations. So my advice would be go through, as Tom says, have a look. Um, the schedules and annexes at the end of the legislation gives you details of certain restrictions and things like that. But a lot, there's a lot of information in there, and yeah, it, it depends really specifically on what F gases, how they're being used, what volumes, etc. Again, it's one of those that certainly we can we can help you, but we need more information in terms of what what is being used and why. Amazing, thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mark. Another one, uh, another one for you. This one is um, from Malcolm. He's asking if the new BSR regulations are going to be added to the last health and safety re regulatory requirements. Uh, yes, the the vast majority of them should already um, be on that. Um, basically. Just thinking about it, I think the, there's only two pieces of, of legislation that are coming in uh, next month on the 6th of April that I don't think we've yet added to us. We, we've drafted them, but I think they were published last week. So they, they're just going through final check to be published. But yes, literally every piece of legislation um, that falls under the building, Safety Act 2022, always associated with it, we will add them all onto us. Um, if you look at those entries, you'll probably notice that we've tried to link a lot of them together because there's multiple pieces of law that all come together to, to work as one. So it can be a little bit complex, but hopefully that should help. But yes, um, everything will be on there if it's not already. Um, but again, it's one of those that, you know, because there are so many pieces of legislation, it's complex. Sometimes you have to kind of piece it all together to understand absolutely everything and, and how it fits in terms of the control regime you know if you've got any questions um give us a shout if you're a subscriber open a helpline we can we can help you out 
All right, we have another one. I'm not sure if I got this one correct, but maybe you can uh, you can help me help me out here, uh, Matt. Uh, this one is from Richard. Will building works that are mounted on um, high risk buildings but do not interact with the fabric, so basically just set on the rooftop or other surface, with no penetration for for fixing, require still require approval under the regulations. Um, it's a very good question. Um, and very difficult to answer because it, it, it's quite general. You know, my, my my view would be no, yes, possibly. And what I would say is to you know, given the the seriousness of the this legislation and why it's been brought in, I would always err on the side of caution. I totally get what was it Richard you said asked the question. I totally get. You know, that there are some sort of building works that you might be doing to a building. And, yeah, you know, ultimately, it doesn't fall under the scope of building work that requires authorization or approval from the building safety regulator. I, th- I don't want to just say in general, no, you don't need to worry about it because, you know, there will be certain things, you know, if you're, if you're changing the fire load of the building, even if you're not actually changing the, the fabric of the building, you know, all of these things you're going to have to consider and and get approval for. So my advice would be, yeah, there will be, there will be potentially building works where you don't need to get approval and authorization for it. Well, go and check the the legislation, you know, get in contact with the regulator, go and speak to a registered building inspector, go and speak to a registered building control approver, you know, specific to the works that you're doing they're the people that are best placed to provide that guidance on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. Next uh, next one comes from uh, John. Maybe you can answer this one, uh, this one Tom. Uh, his company is exporting steel products into the EU countries. Will CBAM regulations apply to, to them? So I assume he's, yeah, he's, he's strictly asking about export, exporting. Um, so, uh, yep, the reporting requirements under CBAM, um, the EU one, which is currently uh, in place, are for the EU-based country themselves. But if you are exporting into the uh, European Union, they will likely request data from you um, if you are a, a UK company, so outside of the EU, um, on the on the exports that you are putting into the EU market. Um, so you will need to be keeping records and monitoring data when exporting the relevant goods um, into the EU market. Uh, I would recommend uh, the EU has guidance document for operators outside of the European Union, I believe. Um, so if you are putting sort of any goods into the EU market, I would recommend going to look at the, the guidance on that to ensure that any any information that you might be required to provide, uh, you do have um, ready to, to give. Amazing. Thank you very much, uh, Tom. You can see we are now getting close to today's session but i think we still have time for one more question before we conclude uh this one is again from richard we have an office in uh they have an office in wales but they don't separate they they don't separate waste how can they deal with this uh yeah um so um so if you are currently not um, separating waste, uh, I would recommend contacting the uh, the organisation that um, if there is one that handles your waste collections. Um, so these these regulations are right around the corner now. Um, so I would do it sooner rather than later. But then uh, they the uh, waste um, your waste collector will be able to advise you on how they will want waste separating um, because they will be uh, they have been dealing with this for some time now with uh, lots of organisations. Um, if you, it's also worth, um, considering how frequently you will need, once the waste is separated out, depending on what waste you have, how frequently each type will need to be collected, because if it's all together, you know, you don't know exactly how often it will need to be collected. But if you separate it out, um, into its component parts, you might find that some parts you have very little waste of, and, um, it's just something to consider before they come into effect. Because as I say, it is right around the corner. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tom. And that was our Q&A session. Thank you, everyone, for attending.
Today's legal update webinar, we hope you have found it useful in providing a summary of the key legislation changes over the past uh, six months. Again, it was designed as a brief summary, which was meant to highlight the key, the key changes and not the detailed review of each piece of legislation, as well as uh, useful in, in um, providing further changes on the horizon. Please fill in our survey. The link is in the chat to ensure you receive uh, the slides and the answers to all the questions that we received today. By filling in the survey, you will also enable us to identify the most relevant content for our future webinars. Next one is currently scheduled for, for September. And if you're not aware of what we do here at the Compliance People, we provide a legislation update um, service. A, a market leading software supporting organizations in meeting their compliance obligations. And we also provide expert environment, health and safety and quality consultancy, as well as training services. If you'd like to hear more information about uh, our services, just give us a quick call or you can check us out at the compliancepeople.co.uk. Once again, thank you all for joining today's webinar and we are looking forward to see you on the next one. Have a great day, everyone.